Brazilians love to say that Brazil is the country of the future and it will always be. This jaundiced view comes from a particular reading of their own history. To find out why, join me for a brief explainer on Brazilian history and politics. Our count begins in 1500 when a Portuguese nobleman, Pedro Álvarez Cabral, and his fleet landed in near present-day Bahia, somewhere in northeastern Brazil. They got there by mistake, or so the story goes, as they were aiming for India and got blown off course. Greeted by a group of nomadic natives, forests of red-hued timber dubbed Brazil wood, and a lack of precious metals, Cabral's expedition left after just eight days. For the next 30 years, the Portuguese and the rest of Europe paid little attention to the area. This began to change, however, in 1530, in response to the increasing presence of the French along the coast of Brazil, as well as the increase in global sugar production for which Brazil was aptly suited. The Portuguese returned, but unlike the Spanish, their colonization model remained exclusive to the coasts, a legacy that persists to this day as the vast majority of Brazilians still live within a few hours of the Atlantic Ocean. The country's path towards independence began in 1808, when Napoleon's Iberian invasion forced the Portuguese court to resettle to Brazil, at that point the crown's largest and wealthiest colony. After Prince João arrived in Rio de Janeiro, along with the entire royal court, packed into some three dozen ships, he was able to make the colony co-equal with Portugal and establish in Brazil the trappings of a developed economy. He also created a strong centralized bureaucracy. Brazil's patrimonial state, a bureaucratic power serving its own interests, had begun. Unlike other Latin American countries, Brazil had a swift and nonviolent independence. Don João left his son Pedro as a regent after returning to Lisbon, and when soon after the Portuguese insisted on trying to return Brazil to its former colonial status, Don Pedro balked and declared the country independent. The Brazilian Empire was born. The moment itself, on September 7, 1822, was uneventful. It basically consisted of Pedro drawing his sword and proclaiming independence or death when he received a letter outlining the Portuguese demands. There was some fighting between the two sides, but it was nowhere near as violent or prolonged as in Spanish America. In fact, it only took three years for Portugal to recognize Brazilian independence. This helped Brazil enjoy a smooth transition from colonial to independent power. Thus began a pattern in Brazil that has held constant through the centuries. The country has avoided dramatic political and social ruptures, opting instead for incremental change, or in some cases, little change at all. At no point in Brazil's history has it experienced a revolution or social uprising that has prompted meaningful or sustained transformation of its existing social structures. This has made for a peaceful existence, but has also meant that in terms of elite dominance over political and economic institutions, not much has changed since the days of the Braganza monarchy. This is not to say that conflict has been completely absent from Brazilian life. Take the Brazilian Empire, for example. It lasted from 1822 to 1889, or 67 years. But while the monarchy itself was never close to being removed prior to that date, it experienced a number of crises that brought the country itself to the brink of separation. This occurred as a result of the sudden departure of Dom Pedro I in 1831, who despite having given up his claim to the Portuguese throne, when his younger brother Dom Miguel tried to take the throne from his daughter, Maia, he returned to Portugal to lead the forces to stop the usurpation. Dom Pedro succeeded, but died of typhoid only three years later. That left his son, Dom Pedro II, a five-year-old, theoretically in charge. But while he came of age, a regency ruled in Brazil. The absence of the monarch brought factional conflicts and the region struggled to keep peace. There were multiple uprisings during this period, including five in Rio de Janeiro state alone, along with other separatist rebellions in Bahia, Maranhão, Minas Gerais, Pará, Rio Grande do Sul, and Sao Paulo. That Brazil did not disintegrate during that period in comparison to most of Spanish America was due to three reasons. The first was the leadership of Luis Alves de Silva, the future Duke of Caxias, who was adroit in putting the rebellions down. The second was the specter of social revolt and social disintegration, which kept the elite united. And finally, the coronation of Dom Pedro II, who helped give the Brazilian elite someone to rally around. This period, however, 
was not inconsequential. The autonomy the Regency provided to the several regions to stop the rebellions ended up cementing Brazilian federalism as a norm. Another conflict with serious consequences was the war with Paraguay in 1864. Brazil had lost Uruguay, its cisplatine province, in 1828, but it continued to meddle in its internal affairs. When it tried to impose a government on Uruguay, the opposing Uruguayan side asked Paraguay and its dictator, Francisco Solano Lopez, for help. The Paraguayan leader warned the Brazilians that any troops it sent to Uruguay would be considered a declaration of war on Paraguay, but the Brazilians ignored him, thinking it was a bluff. They were wrong. Problem was that when the Paraguayans marched to fight the Brazilians, they marched through neutral Argentine territory, which then prompted Argentina to also declare war on Paraguay. It soon was a triple alliance, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, with the troops led by Duke Ocasias that completely decimated Paraguay, but still dragged on for six years, mostly because the Paraguayans refused to surrender and it took the Allies a long time to marshal effectively all of their resources. There were a number of consequences for Brazil. These included the growth of manufacturing, the building of roads, and the settling of European immigrants in the southern provinces, the professionalization of the armed forces, and their concentration in Rio Grande do Sul, and the increased power of the central government. Most important for the future, the war brought the military firmly into the political arena. Military officers were keenly aware that the war had exposed the military's lack of equipment, training, and organization. They blamed these shortcomings on civilian officials. In the next decades, reformist officers would be one of the reasons for the fall of the empire. The other reason was the abolition of slavery. Brazil was the last country in the Western world to abolish it in 1888. Even then, the country's abolitionist Golden Act was promulgated by Princess Isabel while Don Pedro II was traveling in Europe. Final abolition, therefore, did not come about from a disruptive civil war as in the United States. Rather, it was facilitated economically by the advent of cheap labor from European immigrants. The long-lasting institution of slavery in Brazil meant that the Brazilian state didn't invest in the education, health, or development of poor Brazilians for centuries. And the sheer magnitude of the slave trade, an estimated 4 to 5 million slaves came to Brazil from Africa made the longevity of slavery that much more corrosive to any semblance of republican rule after the end of the empire. Slavery left a deeply ingrained class hierarchy in which the white elite was educated and wealthy and the darker skinned slaves and working class were poor and neglected. Indeed, the legacy of slavery was to be felt for centuries to come. But in 1889, it had a more immediate effect. Its abolition was the final blow to any remaining belief in the crown's neutrality, and this resulted in an explicit shift of support to republicanism by the ultra-conservatives who realized they no longer needed the crown to protect their interests. Taking advantage of cabinet crisis in 1888 and 1889, and of rising frustration among military officers, republicans drew them into a conspiracy to replace the cabinet in November 1889. Led by Field Marshal Fonseca, what started as an armed demonstration demanding replacement of a cabinet turned within hours into a coup d'etat, deposing Emperor Pedro II. In true Brazilian fashion, however, the political transition brought little upheaval. The coup had almost no support outside a clique of military leaders, but Don Pedro II had become wary of emperorship and despaired over the monarchy's future prospects. Despite his popularity, he did not allow his ouster to be opposed and did not support any attempt to restore the monarchy. This overthrow led to the country's first attempt at republican democracy, what Brazilians call República Velha, or Old Republic. It was modeled around the United States, but in this constitutional democracy, the republic did not have enough popular support to risk open elections, so they were rigged and the landed oligarchs ruled. The Café con Leite, coffee with milk power sharing arrangement emerged, whereby the presidency would alternate between Brazil's two largest states, Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais, respectively coffee and dairy producers. This system consolidated the power and influence of the old monarchical elite and devolved the country into a dominant coronelismo, or rule by local oligarchs known as coronage, 
who would dispense favor in exchange for loyalty. It would take decades for demographic changes and the structural shifts in the economy, especially the growth of the urban middle class, to amass enough power, especially as a result of the Great Depression, to threaten the power of the agrarian oligarchies. The specific issue that ended up toppling the old government structure was disagreement over who should be president. In 1930, President Washington Luis was someone from Sao Paulo, and thus the presidency was supposed to revert back to someone backed by Minas Gerais. But Luis demurred and picked another Paulista, Julio Prestes, who then went on to win the presidency in March 1930. This, in turn, prompted a coordinated revolt months later, which would eventually lead to a coup and the arrival on the scene of a man that would go on to dominate Brazilian politics for 20 years, Getulio Vargas. Vargas was born in Rio Grande do Sul and was a member of the Gaúcho landed oligarchy. He had risen through the system of patronage and clientelism, but he had a fresh vision of how Brazilian politics could be shaped to support national development. He understood that with the breakdown of direct relations between workers and owners in the expanding factories of Brazil, workers could become the basis for a new form of political power, populism. His rule oscillated between dictatorship and popularly elected government as he sought to transform Brazil from a plantation-based economy into an industrialized powerhouse using government intervention. This culminated with the Estado Novo, or New State, where Vargas' government revolved entirely around the idea of developmentalism. This was expressed not only in strong rhetoric, but also by lending protection to domestic industries and by devoting state funding to investment aimed at kickstarting strategic sectors and setting up the necessary infrastructure. Vargas created state monopolies for oil, Petrobras, mining, Vale, steel making, the National Siderurgy Company, and automobiles, the National Motors Factory. His last presidential term was a period of deepening political polarization. The military saw red in every attempt to expand labor's influence and objected to wage increases for workers when the value of their own salaries was eroding steadily. Meanwhile, the administration was hampered by an economic crisis, congressional opposition, and impatience among his supporters. There were charges of corruption against his closest associates, and when one of his aides appeared to have been directly involved in an assassination attempt against an opposition journalist and in the death of an Air Force major, the armed forces seemed to be prepared to push Vargas to resign. Faced with the possibility of a coup, or perhaps in an effort to avoid possible bloodshed, Vargas committed suicide. Whatever his intention, his suicide had a powerful effect. It was able to postpone a coup for a while, but it still eventually came, this time on March 31, 1964. The coup was virtually bloodless. There was little support for the then-president, Joao Goulart, and even his base, the labor unions, failed to rise in his favor. Most political leaders regarded military rule as the only alternative to strikes, mutinies, and daily chaos. While the president chosen after the coup, Humberto Castelo Branco, sincerely believed that the armed forces were merely engaged in using its moderating power and would soon transition to a more reliable civilian president, his was a minority view within the military. Instead, they would go on to rule Brazil for more than 20 years. During that time, free speech was curbed and any opposition crushed. Hundreds of people were killed and disappeared, and although these numbers were low compared to neighboring countries, the use of torture was widespread. This included rape and castration. Beginning in the 1970s, mostly as a result of massive economic upheaval, the dictatorship began to relax its stranglehold on democracy. Finally, in 1985, after massive mobilization across the country, that demanded direct presidential elections, the military stepped down, paving the way for Brazil's current period of participatory government in a new constitution in 1988. The new constitution enshrined fundamental rights for women, indigenous people, and other minorities, and also created multiple avenues for direct popular participation besides regular voting, such as referendums and the ability of ordinary citizens to propose laws. Nonetheless, the patrimonial order remained intact through the first several democratically elected presidents. The first, Collor Gimelo, ended up impeached and removed over corruption allegations. The second, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, 
a renowned sociologist best known for his work on dependency theory, an economic policy usually associated with the left, ended up embracing neoliberal economics. And although he was able to curb the massive inflation the country had been experiencing for nearly a decade, his economic policies, particularly privatization, led to huge unemployment rates and very high inequality. In theory, this was supposed to change with the election of Luis Inácio da Silva, better known as Lula, in 2002. A shoeshine boy turned union leader, championing labor rights and more equal distribution of wealth, Lula represented Brazil's first real challenge to the patrimonial order. Starting in 1989, he had successfully ran for president in three elections, falling short due to his radical leftist rhetoric and rough-cut appearance. But for the 2002 elections, he softened both his message and his image, campaigning in a suit and tie with Polish teeth and espousing a more moderate pro-poor, pro-growth message. Promising to clean up politics in Brasilia, he was elected president by a landslide. For the first time in Brazilian history, the PT, or Workers' Party, held the presidency, and it appeared that the ruling elite had at last lost its grasp on political power. Lula completed two terms as president and undeniably oversaw a broadening of political participation from 2002 to 2010. High commodity prices for Brazil's principal exports coupled with robust social welfare programs resulted in a meaningful reduction in poverty levels and a growth of the middle class. As opposed to scaring investors, Lula became the darling of the international financial market for his commitment to low inflation and fiscal spending limits. At the same time, his successful anti-poverty programs made him beloved by Brazil's poor. During the halcyon days of Lula's two administrations, Brazil had the Midas touch. In addition to its macroeconomic stability, weathering the 2009 global economic downturn, virtually unscathed, and international prestige, it served as a model to the developing world in balancing the needs and demands of both Sao Paulo financiers as well as its indigent poor. Constitutionally banned from seeking a third term, Lula left office the most popular president in Brazilian history. Thus, his hand-picked successor, Dilma Rousseff, had it made. A relatively unknown figure in national politics, she had never held elected office before, but as energy minister and then Lula's chief of staff, she was known as a tough and competent administrator, and more importantly, she had Lula's blessing and was eager to continue his agenda. Things started to turn for the PT, however. First, a huge political scandal known as the Lava Jato, or car wash, rocked the Brazilian political world. It began as a money laundering investigation at a car wash business in Brazil in 2014, hence the name, and soon expanded to pro-corruption allegations at Petrobras, where executives apparently accepted bribes in return for awarding contracts to construction firms at inflated prices. As dozens and dozens of senators, representatives, and other important public figures, including mayors, governors, and ministers, were implicated, it proved to Brazilians that the corruption problem was a structural one and that most of what happened in the country did so as a result of some form of kickback or another. The political upheaval in turn led to an economic crisis as the commodity boom that had propped up the Brazilian economy began to fade and the political class was unable to make changes to deal with the unemployment and inflation problems. As the twin crisis grew, Dilma was re-elected in 2014 with the tightest of margins since the return of democracy, but the taste of victory for the PT didn't last very long. Only a little over a year later, she had to face an impeachment process where the Senate first suspended her powers and then removed her from office entirely. The accusations were of fiscal mismanagement, allegations that she knowingly used tricks to hide government spending to make it look like the government was hitting its deficit targets. These were as flimsy as they sound and the impetus of her removal was more as a result of Brazilians fed up with the political class and the economic crisis that continued unabated than any particular crime. The ironic thing was that many of those who ended up voting to end her presidency were guilty of far worse crimes, as the public would find out as the Lava Jato investigations continued. In the meantime, the whole process paralyzed the Brazilian political world for nearly nine months. It discredited the PT polarized the country and sent the most popular politician in the country, Lula, to jail. This development was even flimsier than Jilma's, and many neutral observers found it to be a travesty of justice 
and then mostly as political revenge. Thus, not surprisingly, Lula was set free on November 8, 2019. But if the motive was to prevent Lula from running for office, it was successful. Instead, his replacement, Fernando Aji, a former Sao Paulo mayor, lost to Jair Bolsonaro in the 2018 general election. Bolsonaro was a former military officer, an obscure backbencher who had been in the Brazilian Congress for 27 years. An ultra-conservative flamethrower, he had passed exactly two laws in his entire time as a representative, but this didn't seem to matter much to the Brazilian public. If anything, his explicitly sexist and racist views and his attitude that the only mistake the dictatorship made was to torture people instead of killing them, as he put it, was for some refreshingly honest. Exactly the type of strongman Brazil needed to solve the problems that PT couldn't or wouldn't. So how has his presidency turned out? Exactly as you might expect. The economy was already suffering even prior to COVID, growing at an even lower rate than his immediate predecessors, but has since fallen off a cliff. He has been particularly detrimental to indigenous people in the country and for environmental protection, claiming that the massive fires in the Pantanal in the summer of 2020 had been started by environmental NGOs. Bolsonaro's handling of COVID hasn't been any better. For months he downplayed it, and Brazil now sits as the country with the second most deaths in the world and seventh per capita. Still, even with his disastrous performance, his approval rating remains in the 40s. Is that a good sign for the future of Brazil? I wouldn't count on it.